A 42-yard attempt by Ephremian. Snaps it down. The kick is blocked. Rolling loose on the field. It is picked up by Gallo. He tries to throw a pass. Deflected in the air. Grabbed by Bass. 40, 35, 30. He's going to score. 15, 10, 5. Touchdown. Gallo had the football. And it looks from here as if he tried to throw a forward pass with it. But when I looked up, Bill Brundage was in front of me, and of course when he's in front of me, and I'm five foot seven with my hair up, and he's in front of me at six foot four, 270 pounds, I couldn't see anything downfield. So, and I didn't realize my hands were too small. The ball just slipped out of my hands. The only thing that bothers me is I didn't do it often enough. I threw one pass, and I've made so much of a, a fortune doing a banquet speaking. If I had thrown the pass more often, maybe I would have done much better. Maybe I would have been a color analyzer on one of the networks. The story you're about to see is a big, fat lie. No names have been changed to protect anybody. This is Robbie Graham speaking. As a South Florida resident and growing up in South Florida in the early 1970s, I wasn't quite five years old when the Miami Dolphins defeated the Washington Redskins in Super Bowl VII, capping off the NFL's only unbeaten season. At that time, I was simply too young to fully understand what the Dolphins did that fateful Sunday in Los Angeles in January 1973 and I wasn't quite six years old when they repeated as NFL champions when they clobbered the Minnesota Vikings in Super Bowl VIII. Legend has it that ever since this great accomplishment was made the 72 Dolphins celebrate each year when the last undefeated team is defeated. As a South Florida resident I can tell you that it's not a myth it's the truth. When this happens, they, the champagne is uncorked and flows like water. Now, 50 years later, the 2022 Miami Dolphins have done incredibly well so far and have a chance to at least make the playoffs. The last team that almost went undefeated that is well known was the 2007 New England Patriots for they went the regular season undefeated in a 16-game regular season. And that's a feat in itself. But the New York Giants had other ideas in Super Bowl 42, 
when Eli Manning and David Tyree had the now famous helmet catch, and Manning's touchdown pass to Plaxico Burris gave the Giants the victory and dashed the Patriots' chance for true excellence. In 1985, the Chicago Bears almost went undefeated as well and dominated the Patriots in Super Bowl XX. Their only loss that year was to, guess who, the Dolphins and Dan Marino's brilliant passing attack. Should the 2022 Dolphins make it to the Super Bowl, it would be monumental as they will honor what their predecessors did 50 years ago. From NFL Films, former Miami Dolphins defensive tackle Manny Fernandez, former fullback Larry Zonka, and the late great head coach Don Shula retell the accounts of Super Bowl VII. And for one season in 1972, the Miami Dolphins were perfect, and still to this day, the only team to have done so. NFL Network presents America's Game, a countdown of the 20 greatest Super Bowl champions. And now, number one. Perfection in sports usually is limited to a snapshot in time. The perfect punch, or putt, or shot. Occasionally, it can be sustained for an entire routine, or race, or game. But in the NFL, only the 1972 Miami Dolphins were perfect for an entire season. Don Shula coached the perfect team. He arrived in Miami in 1970 at the age of 40, but he'd already been a head coach in the NFL for seven years and he'd already lost an NFL championship and Super Bowl III. The game is over. The New York Jets are the world champions. Shula knew perfection would come with a heavy price. The players he inherited in 1970 would soon learn that lesson. Shula had a very keen sense of being in control. When you come into a situation like he came into, where he didn't draft hardly any of the people, I mean, he stepped in with a team that was there. People have been around, people that weren't too much younger than Shula. And as a result of that, he knew that he had to be the single voice. And let there be no mistake, his voice was final. Hold up, hold up, what the hell's wrong with our snap count? Back in a huddle, let's go. What he said was what he meant, and what he meant was the way it was going to be. When Coach Shula first arrived... Let's get something out of the drill. Everything we do is for a reason. We found out real quick there was going to be a change in the culture. <laughs> With the 12-minute run, four-day practices, meetings until 11 o'clock at night, we were either on the field or in the meeting rooms. Seemed like 16 hours a day. Hardly had enough time to get any sleep. Shula had no mercy on us. We weren't even allowed water on the field. 
and they complained and, and moaned about it. And then we won our first game, and then we won our second game. Then later in the year, when the players were interviewed, they said that, you know, you know, how did this turnaround come about? And they all said invariably, you know, we worked harder than the other team. We practiced harder. We're out there later, and uh, we got more accomplished. In Shula's first year in Miami, the Dolphins won 10 games, seven more than in the previous season. He had a way of getting the most out of you, and I think he did it by getting the most out of himself. We could see how hard he worked. We could see how intense he was. Hey, Blake! Blake! Get in there! Let's go! Get set! What the hell are you doing? No secret why he was the winningest coach in football. In 1971, Shula led Miami to Super Bowl VI. It was his third title game in eight years, and this time, he planned on being rewarded for all of his hard work. He got it from Miami. He thinks got to win. It got to. Why? Yes, all this way for nothing, you know. No sense in losing now. The Dolphins' two-year turnaround did an about face against the Dallas Cowboys. To this day, it's hard for me to talk about that loss and not get emotional. I'd worked so hard to get there. It, it was just a terrible feeling, just like I'd let the whole world down. It, it, it was, without a doubt, uh, to that point, worst moment of my life. I left there, and I sat on the bumper of a car and just broke down and cried like a baby. Last time I cried was when Yeller died. To cry over a poor performance is a lot of horror in my mind, but <clears throat> I wanted to get even. Dallas made us look bad that day. Dallas made us look bad because we already made ourselves look bad. And I knew that. That served as the launch pad uh, for the undefeated season. Coach Shula, I've, I've never seen him quite like he was that day. He just looked at everybody and said, this is not going to happen to us again. When we came back to Miami, they wanted to have a parade for us in downtown Miami. And I refused to have the parade. I said, I don't believe in a parade for losers. I said, hopefully, in the future, we're going to have a parade recognizing us as winners. And we'll be there for that. Yeah, for me, for me, without a doubt, the 72 season did start that evening in New Orleans. You know, when the 72 camp opened, it was a different football team. You could see it in the other players' eyes, in their motions. We all knew why we were there, and, and that was to get back to the Super Bowl and win it. I don't know how many fellas in that 72 team remember this, but at one of the very first meetings that Shula had, when we all came back together in 72, he said our objective this year is to go undefeated. Did he believe that we were going undefeated? No, I don't I don't think he did, no. But he did say that. And, and I remember sitting in my seat thinking, oh my God, this guy is possessed. He's the devil. The devil and his dolphins should have felt right at home in the 1972 season opener when Miami traveled to sweltering Kansas City for the first game ever at Arrowhead Stadium. And we go in there and it's the hottest game that I've ever coached. I'll never forget that game because uh, I had a white shirt on with my game plan with notes that I made in ink on the game plan in my pocket. And I looked down and the ink was running off the game plan onto my shirt. And I look across the field and the only guy that's got a coat on was Hank Stram. And he's standing there just bearing the heat. Neither the heat nor the Chiefs could slow down the Dolphins. A great reception by Marlon Frisco. In their 20 to 10 win, they followed the pace set by future Hall of Famer Larry Little, number 66. Larry knew how we were affected by the heat. And he didn't want the Kansas City Chiefs to know. So when the third quarter changed and we had that time where we had to go down to the other end of the field, 
he led our team in a sprint down at the other end. And the Kansas City Chiefs were thinking that we're going to tire out in that heat looked and saw that happening and I, and I think that that gave us great uh, motivation and it sort of demoralized them. Following a win over the Oilers, the physical demands of football tested fullback Larry Zonka in Minnesota. Usually it's Zonka delivering the hit on the defensive guy. But on this particular play, Roy Winston was there. Roy Winston just about cut him in half at the kidneys. I didn't know Larry, I didn't know if he could get up off the field. You could hear the crack. I thought he broke his back or broke some ribs. I know this, every once in a while, when I get out of bed on cold mornings up here in Alaska, I think about Roy. And I hope somewhere out there in South Louisiana that Roy's getting up and I hope he's thinking about me. This week three matchup would be the closest the Dolphins came to losing in 1972. Trailing 14 to six in the fourth quarter, Garo Yepremian hit a 51 yard field goal. The kick is up, he has the distance. It is gone, Garo Yepremian with a vengeance. And with less than two minutes remaining, all pro quarterback Bob Greasy calmly led the Dolphins towards a game winning score. Obviously, you think it's, it's down there on the three-yard line. You've got the strongest, biggest uh, bull fullback in, in football. And what do you do? You fake it to him, and you go to the least likely target, Jim Mandich. 14 to 9. Reese drops the throw. He fires the middle. Wide open touchdown is Jim Mandich. The great thing about the 72 team was that we didn't really care whose number was called. If they called me on a 119, the tight end delay, they did it because they believed the defense would suck up on it and Mandich would come open. He came wide open. That was exactly the right call. We did that game in and game out. That's what perfection's all about, is being able to control that kind of emotion that says, I want to be the guy to score. We didn't feel that way. I've never been with a group of men that were more giving in the sense that we didn't care which one of us did it. We just wanted to do it. There was a lot of intelligence and talent on our Super Bowl teams, but I know where the heart was. Number 39, Larry Zonka. Give it a Zonka. Giving the ball to Larry Zonka was a sound offensive strategy. Number 39 had a running philosophy that challenged the laws of physics. Two bodies can, can occupy the same position at the same time. As long as one's bigger and faster and going the opposite direction, they're there at the same time, but then the little one gets out of the way. He's the only running back in the history of the National Football League that's ever been called for unnecessary roughness on a tackler. Larry lowers his shoulder and his forearm and he hits the guy and he knocks him back into the middle of the field. And it, you know, cracked his jaw, drove him up, you know, folded him up. You know, he was down doing the twitch. And it was right in front of Shula, who was standing right there seeing it come to the bench. He's screaming right in my face. That's a great hit, great hit. About that time, <laughs> the flag flew in. So I think it's on the tackler. It's always on the tackler. He's marking it off against us. And I said, well, you're going the wrong way. He said, no, I'm not. Look what 39 did to that poor tackler. <laughs> and he, he looked at the flag and went, you dumb son of a... <laughs> and that quick, he went, uh, he went bonkers on me. Yeah, we got the 15 yards, but we won the game, so. Zonka and running mate Jim Kick were also winning national attention. The duo became known as Butch and Sundance. They both arrived in Miami in 1968, and they didn't mind sharing the spotlight or the football. But in 1972, the Dolphins had a third running back who wanted to ride alongside them, Mercury Morris, number 22. When I got down to Miami in 1970, and Mercury was a guy with great ability, but he hadn't proven himself as being a dependable running back. Kick was dependable, and, and I went with Jim Kick for a long time as a starter. 
But then I, I started to realize the great ability of a Mercury Morris and what he added to our offense. So I started to work him in more and more to the offense. And I got to the point where I alternated, uh, depending on the situation, Jim Kick, you know, in passing situations, pass run situations, and Mercury in run pass situations. Uh, where, what yard line? I turn for Kick. And that became, I think, the beginning of situation substitution. It was also the beginning of a very crowded backfield. Now, that could have been a, a situation there where Mercury came in and it all blew up because the media really tried to blow it up. The game had to be full of mixed emotions for you. Uh, you gained over 118 yards, but your best friend, Jim Kick, almost didn't get an opportunity to play. Well, Jane, this is a touchy subject at the moment. I don't want to go into it very much. Uh, both Merck and Jim are, are fine halfbacks. Uh, no matter which one's sitting on the bench, he's not going to be happy with it. Personally, uh, you know, it's hard for me to adapt. I don't think anybody can uh, be happy uh, sitting on the bench. The same starting lineup? Yes, we're going to continue the same way. And, uh, of course, uh, the Jim Kick, Mercury Morris situation, uh, I'll just make that decision right before kickoff, depending on what series uh, we're going to open with. In 1972, Morris had 190 carries, 50 more than in his first three seasons combined. Kick had the fewest carries in his career to that point. Jim, in my opinion, was the guy that had to swallow the biggest lump uh, of pride because he cared more about being on a winning team than whether he was starting or not starting and any of that. The way Jim Kick handled Mercury Morris's situation and Mercury Morris handled the situation and Larry Zonka, the three of us were, were ground zero on that. I thought we handled it with a lot of class. You know, Jim and I were highlighted and spotlighted the year before, and Mercury sat in the wings. We got there, we almost got it done, but it didn't work, all right? We lost it all right at the end. So what can we do as a team to get better? Well, maybe putting Mercury in that mix will make the difference. And we all had that appreciation of each other because we understood how it fit together like that, not like that. Don Shula rotated his running backs, but he never had to worry about changing his quarterback until week five. Shaken up on the play is Greasy. Yeah, it looks like his, his right ankle, Rick. Uh, it may be right here. He may have to go out of the ball game. When Bob broke his leg in the San Diego game, I can remember Bill Stanfield looking at me, and it's almost like we said it at the same time, because we're in deep <laughs> With Bob Greasy injured, Shula turned to 38-year-old Earl Morrill, who had played for Shula in Baltimore. Morrill had been the losing quarterback in Super Bowl III, but Shula brought him to Miami, even though he was seven years older than the next oldest Dolphin. He was older than some of our coaches, and uh, almost as old as Shula. Danny Dodd, the equipment manager, set a rocking chair up in front of his locker. That was his welcome to the Dolphin locker room. All summer, he toiled in that heat and just did not look very good. I was very confident in Earl's ability to know what was going on. He's a very experienced quarterback. Whether physically he could hold up to it, what I was afraid of was when he came out was he was going to be on the next stretcher is what I was afraid of. But I didn't know how tough that old bulldog was until he got in the fight. Morrill on the snap, drops straight back to throw. He sets up, he is firing down to the corner, Warfield, touchdown! Oh. Earl drops to throw, he sets, he is firing the near side, fully open, touchdown! Oh. There's where the experience, the intestinal fortitude come in. That's why they pay the Don Shoulders of the world the big money. That's what a coach gets paid to do. It's to get you to buy it back in again. I mean, he had to sell us on Earl Morrill, and he did. Mid-season, Earl. Okay, babe. I had the confidence that Earl would do it in the pressure of a big ball game, and that's the kind of quarterback Earl was. And when I look back on my coaching career and all the quarterbacks that I've coached, I've got Hall of Famers and Johnny Unitas, Bob Greasy, and now Dan Marino. You know, Earl Morrill's in my own personal Hall of Fame. Bob Greasy would be gone for months. Earl Morrill was now the quarterback of the NFL's only undefeated team.
the Dolphins at that time had the reputation of being a very methodical, business-like football team. And that was the image Coach Shula wanted us to put out front. But underlying that, we were a very rebellious team, a team full of individuals. It was a team with a very strong character, but also with an awful lot of characters. My God almighty! Don Shula's not-so-straight arrows made it a point to express themselves, from the afro-wearing cornerback Curtis Johnson to the bald Cypriot kicker Garo Yepremian. Won't you come home, Bill Bailey? Won't you come home? You've been away too long. Shula worked them hard. They took it upon themselves to play hard. None more so than Manny Fernandez, who got as far away from the field as possible during his free time. Hard to explain how you can fall in love with a place that really most people would never want to set foot in. But I did. I just fell in love with the Everglades. Shula gets a hold of you. He doesn't like you out here in the woods or out of the Everglades. He kind of frowns on it. No, no way would I want to go out into the Everglades. You know, there are golf courses. I want manicured things that I'm <laughs> walking out onto where I know where everything is, and I got a golf club in my hand. But the Everglades, that's, that's for Manny Fernandez. Zonka is a big hunting and fishing guy. They didn't have the coordination to play golf. Let's go grab a gator then. All right. <laughs> Manny Fernandez, in my opinion, is the only defensive lineman in the history of the National Football League that can get into a nest of alligators and come out with an alligator unscathed. Where do you find people like that? Well, you are a pissed off mama, aren't you? What do you guys think of that? <laughs> <laughs> that really was when I got the idea of maybe playing a little trick on Coach Shula. So I, I open a shower door, put my foot in, and I look, and there's a live alligator looking up at me like that. And he took off, I mean, like a scalded hound. Manny says, Coach, can't you take a joke? Don has a good good sense of humor, and uh, it just never really showed. <laughs> Zonka said, Coach, you ought to be happy as opposed to being upset. I said, why should I be happy? He said, we took a vote, and you only passed by one as to whether or not we should tape up the mouth of the alligator. There were no alligators where Manny Fernandez came from. When I came out of Utah in 1968, the Dolphins were a relatively new franchise. They were just going into their third season. They hadn't attracted much of a market in Miami. There was a large Latin population, and part of the reason they brought me down there was to help sell tickets. Ed Pebram, here, get your line up! While I am a Spaniard, I don't speak a word of it. Fernandez couldn't speak Spanish, and he could barely see. I probably had the worst eyesight in football. I think my vision was actually 24-25 in one eye and 2400 in the other. And uh, while I couldn't see the football well in the air, I didn't really have to to be a defensive lineman. Just look for the blur, chase the blur, catch it, and that's how I played football, sort of by braille. Manny Fernandez, his college coaches at Utah would not even recommend him for the pros. He walked into the Dolphin camp as a free agent. Now he's one of the best in the game. He spins, tries to get the hand off away. Never got the recognition that he, that he really deserved. That lack of recognition made Fernandez a perfect fit with the rest of the Dolphins' defense. No-name defense. Love it, hate it, a uh, little of both. That's a name that was given to us by Tom Landry. He referred to us in an article that was stuck up on our defensive meeting room bulletin board. Uh, just a bunch of no-name guys that uh, I don't know much about, I think was his quote. Their Q rating was low. Their IQ, however, was off the charts. In one season, the entire defense made a total of nine mental errors. That says a lot about the intelligence of our team. I think that name has worked two ways for us. In, in many ways, it's hindered some fine individual performances. In other respect, uh, gave us an identity, whether we liked it or not. In 1972, 
Miami had the NFL's number one ranked defense. But linebacker Nick Bonaconti, number 85, is the only member of the no-names in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. When you go in the Hall of Fame and when you look at my bust, you're not looking at the bust of Nick Bonaconti. You were looking at the bust of the no-name defense. We could talk about the Purple People Leader, Steel Curtain, all the other great defenses out there, and they can call us no-names. I don't care. We were the best defense in football. That defense and three touchdowns from Mercury Morris helped the Dolphins improve to 9-0. The victory made Don Shula the youngest coach in NFL history to win 100 games. You know, the highlight of the year isn't 100 victories. That's not what I'm looking for. That's a personal thing, and personal things are really insignificant. The thing I want is a team thing, and the height of a, a team accomplishment is a Super Bowl victory. In 1972, despite the ongoing Vietnam War and the Watergate scandal, Richard Nixon won his second presidential election in a landslide. Yet amid all the turmoil, a football coach graced the cover of Time magazine. America turned its attention to the quest for the NFL's first perfect season. Shula addressed it uh, nearly every week, starting from about 8-0 and on, that we uh, had to make a, an even greater effort to not get caught up in that. Uh, it's impossible not to get caught up in that. You know, we'd love to go 14-0. I'd be, uh, you know, mighty proud to be on a team that's 14-0. Don Shula's focus was on redemption, not perfection. The fact that we had a chance to do something that nobody else has ever done still wasn't as important to us as, uh, as being able to get to the Super Bowl and win the Super Bowl. If we were 16-1 and one, and that loss was the Super Bowl loss, that season would have been a failure for us. First down, Dolphins at the Jets' 31-yard line. Earl Despite the talk of a perfect season, the Dolphins' actions spoke louder than their words as their 38-year-old backup quarterback continued to lead them to victories. How about that for old Bones? I got him out of the rocking chair to play. And he... Which was a good thing because Don Shula did not tolerate losing. And often, he wasn't happy after a win. He strove for perfection all the time. All Don Shula's life, he treated a close victory as a loss. We sometimes would get confused. Did we win that game or lose it coming out of meetings on Tuesday? We once beat New England 52 to nothing or something. I don't know what it was. And he even had corrections in that game. I mean, you know, I. The guy was obsessed with that. The fact that we won doesn't mean that there weren't the mistakes. There were a lot of mistakes in the ballgame. His attention to detail had a psychological impact as well. It pissed you off. But don't you see that whole mechanism is a way to keep you focused? Otherwise, you just gawk in and pat each other on the back, say, good game, and you forget about it. Shula's attention to detail was never more focused than on the practice field, where he specialized in multitasking. Not many men can do this. There's a lot of women in the world can concentrate on five or six things. My mother's one of them, my aunt's a lot. There's a lot of women I meet that can concentrate on multiple things. There's only a few men that I've ever met that can concentrate on more than one or two things at a time. Don Shula's one of them. Charlie, come back toward the ball. He had the ability to stand on a practice field and look around while he's watching everything that's happening in the skeleton passing drill. Good, Paul, way to come back and get it. And managed in between corrections on the skeleton passing drill to holler down and correct something that he saw the offensive lineman do 80 yards away. I Not once did I see this. Many, many times I saw that. If you just let up a little bit in a drill uh, 100 yards away from where he was, you could hear him yelling at you. Pay attention, you know. Say, we only have two hours out here. You got to be attention. You got to be in on this thing, you know. And you wonder, how the hell did he see that? In 72, we were so determined to pay attention to detail, to win everything, to prove to ourselves that we could, that we did. Firing deep downfield, and he's in for the touchdown. Following a win in New York, the 13-0 Dolphins went home for the regular season finale against the Colts. For the third straight time, Shula shut out his former team.
this is a, a true effort today of 40 people uh, wanting to be the first team in history to win 14 games in a regular season. So we're very proud of this football team. I just wasn't going to dwell on that kind of uh, talk. It was didn't really matter. Going undefeated 14-0 and and losing the first playoff game would have done us a lot of good, wouldn't it? In their first playoff game, the Dolphins did trail the Cleveland Browns late in the fourth quarter. We had gotten so used to somebody coming up with a big play when we needed it that I never really thought about losing the game. It was more a feeling of who's going to do it? Who's going to make it happen? There was always somebody coming in on that white horse. Thankfully, Butch Cassidy Kick was used to riding horseback. The man who swallowed his pride most of the season wasn't about to choke now. They were undefeated and unselfish, as evidenced by the first man to greet kick on the sideline, number 22, Mercury Morris. The Dolphins were headed to the AFC Championship game. In 1972, home field advantage for the playoffs rotated by division. So the unbeaten Dolphins had to travel to Pittsburgh for the AFC Championship. But on game day, Manny Fernandez's thoughts returned to the Everglades. The headline in the paper uh, read, L-1011 crashes in the Everglades. Well, <laughs> I had gotten married just two weeks before that, and my wife was flying the L-1011. She was a flight attendant for Eastern. I thought she was on that airplane. Called the house, not really expecting to get an answer. The phone rang and rang and rang and rang and rang, and I just sat there like a zombie, not knowing what else to do. Uh, and then finally it answered, and it was her. And I got all choked up, obviously. Uh, I still get choked up thinking about it, but... Uh, you know, very fortunate she had swapped that flight, and the stewardess she had swapped out with survived it, which was a miracle. Very emotional morning for me, and uh, then we had to go play the Steelers in Pittsburgh. Back and looking again. One week earlier, the Steelers had beaten the Raiders on a play known as the Immaculate Reception. And there's a collision. That's cut out of the The AFC Championship would feature a team that seemed destined to win against a team which refused to lose. Listen, Mr. Rooney, it's luck good to see you and uh, really happy about I want to everything. Wish you luck today, but... Well, I understand. In the early going, Pittsburgh's good luck continued. It is recovered by the Steelers, and it's a touchdown. But the Dolphins, like they had done all year, would find a way to win. The surprise hero this time was number 20, punter Larry Seipel. So that will bring up a fourth down, and Larry Seipel is in the punt. Larry Seipel had a green light. Anytime he felt um, that he could pick up a first down from the punting formation. But if it doesn't work, pretty much it's your ass. You better make it. <laughs> that was my old thought, that you know, you've got the green light, Larry, as long as you make it. From the game films that we'd seen when they when they ran a certain return, everybody would hit and then they would peel to the outside. And as Larry stepped up, he saw him starting to peel, not paying any attention to him. So he just followed him as they peeled to the outside. I remember standing down on the sideline and hearing the Steelers fans screaming, turn around. The defensive line was standing there looking downfield as Stiefel ran right by him, didn't even see him coming. But it was a turning point, a big turning point in that game. Seiple's play set up Miami's first touchdown. Morrill dropping back to throw, he lost one, it is Crockway's on the five. 
But the real turning point might have come at halftime. With the score tied and the Dolphins' offense struggling, Don Shula replaced Earl Morrow, who had led the team to 11 straight wins with Bob Greasy. One of the toughest decisions I ever had to make in my coaching career. I looked him in the eye and he looked right back at me. He said, Coach, he said, I don't agree with you. You know, I, you know, I want to go back in, but I respect your decision. That's the kind of guy that he was. Greasy went in and, you know, through the pass of Warfield, it got us going and gave us that spark that we needed to win the game. Drop back to throw. He sets up. He fires the middle. Warfield's got it. 35, 40, 45, 50. Down to the 40, 35 to the 30. He's dragged down from behind on the Steelers' 25 yard line. For the second week in a row, Jim Kick scored the game-winning touchdown. Miami was going back to the Super Bowl. And somehow, the 16-0 Dolphins were three-point underdogs to the Washington Redskins. You know, you hate to hear teams talking about, you know, they're not showing us respect or lack of respect. But after being undefeated and still being the underdog in the, in the ball game, scratch your head and you wonder, why, you know, why us? Why no respect? You know, what, what have we done wrong? What Don Shula had done wrong was lose two of the previous four Super Bowls. And he was reminded of that often prior to Super Bowl VII. So now I'm sitting there with a reputation of a, of a coach that can win, but he can't win the big game. And you don't ever want to have that said about you if you're in a coaching profession. Shula was particularly edgy because his opponent, Redskin coach George Allen, was the master of football espionage. George Allen would resort to almost anything to find out what the other team was planning. And we were kind of enjoying the week laughing at Shula because he was really paranoid. Shula started getting upset because there were airplanes flying over our practice field. He had tarps up on the on the chain link fence. All these kids come in and try to get a football sign. Shula's checking IDs. <laughs> it's a midget coach. He's really running a movie camera over there, you know, on things. There was no way he could get to another Super Bowl and lose, not Don Shula. If you know the man at all, you just know that couldn't happen, wouldn't happen, wasn't going to happen. End of story, and we were going to win that ball game. Let me tell you something. The only thing I miss about football is about five seconds. Five seconds in a huddle, right before you break the huddle and go up to the line of scrimmage. When you have five of the best offensive linemen that are in tune with you, Wayne Moore, Bob Kuchenberg, Jim Langer, Larry Little, and Norm Evans. And I'm looking across at them. This is the game where we're going 17-0. We're putting the final emphasis on a perfect season. Each one of them is looking at me going, run behind me. They're mouthing the words. They're not over. They can't talk in auto because greasy. They're all pointing to themselves going, anything happens, drift to me. And Bob Kuchenberg grabs me by the face mask and says, you better stick your helmet up my ass on this play because we're going in the end zone. When you have people that intent on victory, you got to just marvel. If I could go back for anything, I'd like to go back in a time machine just to, to live those five seconds and looking in the eyes of those men because that was the most confidence I've ever felt in my life about anything. Super Bowl VII, Larry Zonka ran for 112 yards as the NFL's number one ranked offense took a 14 to nothing lead. <laughs> Miami then focused its number one ranked defense on NFC rushing champion Larry Brown. People thought that we could never shut down our running attack because nobody could. Against the Redskins, Manny so dominated the line of scrimmage that Larry Brown, the great running back from the Redskins, never got to the line of scrimmage. Manny was just too quick for their center. You know, the center tried to block him one-on-one. -on -one. He would throw the center one way or the other and then be in position to make the play.
been, you know, i i had not been blocked one on one in really much of my whole career. so i thought it was like a vacation there for a while. and he's wrapped up. manny fernandez again. why did we play so well? don't know. maybe we were that good. For a bunch of no-names, we did okay. Manny Fernandez led the Dolphins with 17 tackles, but safety Jake Scott, who intercepted two passes, was named the game's MVP. The Dolphins had dominated Washington. Now they were dueling with destiny. If we kick the field goal at the end of the ball game, then we win 17 to zip in our 17-0 perfect season. Field goal makes it 17-0, 17-0. Well, I don't feel we should have gone for the field goal. I think we should have tried to run it down their throat. The minute that you go after something, figuring that you're going to be 17 to nothing in a 17-0 season, that it's destiny. Destiny kicks you right square in your ass. A 42-yard attempt by your premier. Snap, step down, the kick is blocked. Rolling loose on the field. It is picked up by Garrow. He tries to throw a pass. Deflected in the air, grabbed by Bass. 40, 35, 30. He's going to score. Touchdown. By the time that comedy of errors was over, I really wanted to kill him. Not because of the kick, not because of the pass. Gary Yafemi lost his head and tried to throw a pass. But when he didn't have the guts to throw his body at Mike Bass sailing down the sidelines, that was just a total lack of character, courage. Just couldn't believe anybody could be that yellow. Uh, not even Garrow. But he, he surprised me. He was even a bigger coward than I thought he was. The perfect score was no longer a possibility. But Don Shula's perfect season was about to become a reality. 45 seconds to go. This can be the last play of the game. This is, be it. This is it. Come on, stop him this time. Let the clock run out. Fourth down. Here is Kilmer. Back to throw. He is caught. And he has dropped back at the 17 yard line. That's it. It's over. Let go, Nick. E. That's right, man. Don Shula. He had lost twice before in the Super Bowl, and now he watches the clock tick away as Shula has won his Super Bowl. This is my third time around, and I haven't done too well in my first two Super Bowls. There's a lot of people keep reminding me. <laughs> uh, it's been nothing but really frustration, although we've won a lot of football games, and I've been named Coach of the Year. There was always that empty feeling of not really having accomplished the ultimate. And this right here is the ultimate. We stopped them when we had to all day long, made the big turnovers, and just a, a great day for, you know, for me, for, for everybody on the team. It was just a tremendous feeling. I mean, it was, it was better than I thought it was gonna be. On leaving that Coliseum that day, I think I turned around and looked at the scoreboard and it said, Dolphins World Champions. 17 and 0 just happened. You know, there was no script, no plans. It, it just happened, no explaining it. Whether it happens ever again or not, you know, is just have to wait and see. They reached out and grabbed a piece of history. 35 years later, they still hold their accomplishment close to their hearts. It's the one significant thing that you can continue to guard jealously. Ladies and gentlemen, a standing ovation for the greatest football team ever put together. The fact of the matter is, by going undefeated, we live on. Our ghosts crop up every year when anyone makes it past that 5-0 and o mark, then suddenly the 72 Dolphins ghosts start to appear. And that's a hoot. <laughs> I like being a ghost. <laughs> Don Shula and his 1972 Dolphins traveled a road no one else has taken. The team highlights certainly have to be 17 and 0 the only team in history and a special bond has developed with that group of players they wear this ring with pride that's a pretty simple ring but i said it's it's got something very unique on it it's the only one that says perfect season on it and i'll always have this ring right here to remember it by the rest of my life the money most of it's gone but the ring will be here forever
one place in the universe, one space was occupied by perfection, and we got to be a part of it. I'm damn glad I got to be a part of it. video content, photo galleries, and more from America's Game, visit NFL.com slash America's Game.